All right, as we prepare this morning to go to the Lord in worship on this third Sunday after the Epiphany, would you bow with me in prayer? Gracious Lord, as we gather here this morning, help us to always remember that this is the day that you have created, and so let us each rejoice and be glad in this day. And as we worship and praise your holy name here this morning, may we feel the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit as you speak to each of us and speak through our hearts. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. because they matter to you. So let's take a few moments of silent prayer as we go to the Lord in prayer. And, and as I always encourage you, bring your concerns to God, but also bring your joys to God. God has blessed each of us in a number of ways. And so let's bring our joys and our concerns to the Lord. Let us pray. are grateful for all the blessings that you bring into our lives, especially this beautiful day that you have created just for us. Let us rejoice today and be glad in what you have given us and, and the blessings that you continually to bestow on, on us and on our families and in our community and on our church and all around the world for those who trust and believe in you, the joys that you bring into our lives through peace and hope and faith. So Lord, I want to lift up each one who is here today into your love and into your care. Each of us unique and special creations in our own way created by you and each with special gifts and talents. And so Lord, I lift everyone up to you today. Whatever it be lying on their heart, whether it be a joy or a concern or both, that they have the faith today to come to you and bring those things to you. That as they rejoice and bring their praise to you, that also they bring those things to you that lie in their heart that, that are concerning to them. Because we know, Lord, that, that our concerns sometimes act as barriers that stand between us and a full appreciation of service to you in love and in peace and in grace. But also, Lord, we lift up those who are not here with us. There are those who are traveling and there are those who are ill or at home, or in hospitals, or rehabilitation centers. And as always, Lord, we pray for those who are around the world in dangerous and hostile places, and we pray for their families who wait here for their safe return. And Lord, the, the hands that went up and the names that we raised to you represent special needs, needs that we know that you know about, Lord, but we want to raise them to you anyway because you have asked us to do that. So we lift them into your love and your care as well. But Lord, we have to be humble in your presence because we know that we've not always said and done things in the ways that we should. We profess to be followers of Christ, yet Lord, there are times because of our own human emotions that we lash out or, or act out in 
suffering and sorrow or grief or pain. And we know, Lord, that we have created a busyness in our lives. And sometimes, unfortunately, that busyness shuts you out. So, Lord, help us to slow down now and let our souls catch up with the busyness of our lives. And let us spend more time, especially now as we, we gather here together to worship you, as we spend time in communication with you through prayer, that we share more with you and, and in doing so draw nearer to you and closer to you. And by doing that, better serve you by serving those who are around us. So Lord, as we seek forgiveness of our sins, we also seek the nurturement that comes from growing and, and strengthening our faith and hope and love. We just lift all these things to you today. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, the one who taught each of us to pray together that prayer that we now pray as his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our scripture reading this morning from the Old Testament is in the book of Joshua, the 24th chapter. We will be reading verses 14 through 18. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will, say, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us all along the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, and the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. From the, in the New Testament, we'll be reading from the book of Mark, the first chapter, verses 14 through 20. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
thinking it was the very first semester that I went back to college after I got out of the military. And, you know, it was an English class, and we were asked to write a paper on, and the topic was if of all the people who have ever lived on the earth, if you could meet five people, who would they be and why? And I won't get into all of that, but one of the people that I had on my list of five was Mark Twain. And story has it that Mark Twain loved to go fishing, but he hated to catch fish. You see, the problem was he went fishing to relax, and fishing ruined his relaxation since if he caught fish, he had to take them off the hook and he had to find something to do with them. And if he wanted to go relax and do nothing, he said that people said that he was lazy. But if he went fishing, he could relax all he wanted to and people wouldn't bother him because they'd see him sitting by the riverbank and they would say, look, he's fishing. Don't bother him. So Mark Twain had the perfect solution. He would go fishing and he took a pole and he took a line and he took a bobber, but he wouldn't put a hook on the end of it. He would cast the bobber into the water and lay back on the bank and relax. And story has it again that many of his stories came about from him relaxing on the bank with a pole and a line in the water with no hook on it, not being bothered by fish or man. Well, Mark Twain, I think, is a lot like many of those who profess to be Christians today. They have their poles in the water, but there are no hooks on the end. In other words, they're not fishing, they are relaxing. And I don't think that's what Jesus had in mind in our gospel this morning when he said, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Well, let me ask you, have you ever been invited to be a part of something big? I mean, really big, maybe something new and groundbreaking that hadn't been done before? Well, what if accepting that invitation meant that you had to leave familiar surroundings, the comfort of your home, your friends and your family? Would you do it without thinking? Or would you have to think about it for a little while? Well, in our scripture lesson today from the gospel, that's exactly the question that Jesus placed before Simon and Andrew and James and John. Jesus invited all four of them to come and follow me. Now, you hear that part of it, but you don't hear the other part of it. The other story, as Paul Harvey would say. As Jesus called them, I want you to notice what he didn't say. What he did say was, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men or of people. He didn't say, come follow me and I'll give you a time frame. He didn't say, follow me for three years or follow me for a few months and if you don't like it, you don't have to continue. Jesus simply said, follow me. No time frames, no limits, no conditions, no get out clause, just follow me. And then the second thing was he didn't tell them what they were going to face. He didn't tell them that they would go through three years of awesome and unbelievable experiences seeing blind people sighted and seeing deaf people with their hearing back and seeing a lame allowed to walk, even the dead being risen from the dead. He didn't tell them that. He didn't say, you're going to experience years of awesome experiences and then find yourselves in the middle of controversy resulting in my death. No, he didn't tell them what to expect. He simply said, come and follow me. Now, that call that Jesus gave that day to Peter and Andrew and James and John, those were the first. But the calls since then have been many, and they continue to come. Because Jesus is telling you the same thing today that he told them thousands of years ago. You come and follow me. Okay? Don't tell you. I'm not going to tell you what you're going to face. 
I'm not going to tell you how long you want to do this. I'm not going to give you an out clause in this. I want you to follow me. And in return, I will help you to bring others to me. Now, if you are like I am, and most of you are, I'm sure, in, in my own life, I have asked God at different times to reveal His plan to me. Because it gets frustrating sometimes. I, maybe like you, have cried out, God, what do you want from me? What am I supposed to be doing? God, what is your overall plan, and can I please know it? And why does it have to be day to day? Or sometimes hour to hour and minute to minute? But you know what? Even as I ask that, I understand that God has reasons for not telling me everything that's involved. Just as He had reasons for not telling Peter and Andrew and James and John what they would experience, I ask and I know that many times God is not going to tell me. And I know that one of the main reasons is because I just simply can't handle knowing everything. Nor can you. And God knows that. And God has promised He's not going to give us more to deal with than we can deal with. Now sometimes I think it goes right up to the edge. Because sometimes I have to remind myself and remind God, God, you said you weren't going to give me more than I can handle. God says I won't. Tell me how this is going to come out. And God says, you got to stay for the second feature. you got to stay for Act 2. you got to stay and see what goes on here. But what Christ does say to me is the same thing that He said to James and John and Peter and Andrew. When I say, Lord, will you reveal your plan to me? Would you please let me in on this? He says to me, you, come and follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Now, are you aware, I'm sure you are, that there is a huge difference between making a decision and making a commitment. Decision, for example, is if I go to a restaurant, I'm handed a menu, and I have decisions to make and about what I want to eat. And depending on the restaurant, I may have dozens of choices in front of me, and I may choose something, or I've been with people who will make up their mind four or five times. I think I'll have this. And then, well, wait a minute, I'm going to change my mind. I want that. And you can do that. That's okay. That's not a problem. You can change your mind until it's actually delivered out to your table. You can change your mind, and it's not a problem. But making a commitment is different. For example, when it comes to flying an airplane, there is no such thing as a partial commitment. When a pilot of a giant airliner is speeding down a runway, there is a certain point along the way where he cannot decide to stay on the ground. And when he crosses that line, he is committed to getting that giant plane up in the air. Because if he changes his mind, disaster will happen. And at that point, total commitment is called for. Webster's Dictionary defines a commitment as a decision that cannot be recalled. Jesus understood this concept throughout his entire ministry, but especially when he entered the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified. He knew what was before him. He knew what the future was to hold. He was on the runway, and time was passing. The clock was ticking. Not only must a decision be made, but a commitment had to be made as well. And a commitment was made. When Jesus said, Father, if you were willing to take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. Now, we are supposed to emulate Jesus because we are professing to be Christians. But I think in a lot of cases, we go to part A and we leave out part B. We say, Lord, if there's any other way that this cup can cast from me, but then we don't add on in the same breath, but not my will, but your will be done. We want part A, we want to get out of it, but we don't want to say, but Lord, if this is where you want me, this is what I'm going to do. We sometimes have to be pushed into it or grudged into it. Jesus made a 100% commitment to God the Father, and that commitment led Him knowingly to the cross. Now, folks, I don't want to kid you. Commitment isn't easy, and commitment can be costly. To a boxer, for example, 
Commitment is getting up one more time after you've been knocked down repeatedly to a runner. Some of you here are runners. It's running another 10 miles when you don't think you can take one more step. To a soldier, it's going over the hill into the unknown even when you don't know what's waiting on the other side of the hill. And to a Christian, it's putting Christ in charge of your life even when you don't know what He will expect of you or where He's going to lead you. It's putting your faith in God's hands when He said, Come and follow Me, and I will make you fishers of men. You see, commitment is getting up one more time. It's going ten more miles or going over a hill into the unknown. Commitment is saying yes when you haven't even heard the question yet. It's saying yes to God Yes to Christ when He hasn't even told you yet what He wants you to do. Our text says that Jesus said to them, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed Him. And I believe that that call that Jesus made to those disciples is the same call that He gives each of us today in our lives. Folks, the difference between a dreamer and a doer can be found in one word, and that one word is commitment. There's nothing wrong with dreams. We all dream. The older we get, the, the less, the more we realize that our dreams are not going to be accomplished sometimes, but we still dream. And there's nothing wrong with dreaming, but we also have to be doing, and that involves commitment. In my life, I have found that the commitments that I have made have actually made me. And they've had different impacts on my life. My commitment, for example, to join the military. My commitment to go back to college and to graduate. My commitment to the ministry in 1975, to the police service in 1977. The commitment that I made to my wife in 1994 and my commitment to become your pastor in 2005. All of these commitments have changed my life. Someone once said, our lives are not made on the dreams that we dream, but by the commitments that we make. And you know, life is a process. Following Christ is a process and a commitment. And that commitment is the foundation for a successful Christian living, but it takes patience. If you're a fisherman, you know about patience. I'm not a fisherman, but some of you are. Our, our biggest fisherman is gone this morning, Carl, but you know about commitment and you know about patience if you're a fisherman. As fishermen, you know about the love for fishing and you know that fishermen love to talk about their work. I don't want to say exaggerate. Fishermen love to talk about their work. I read a story not long ago about two fishermen that were telling their most, about their most amazing catches. First one said, last week I caught a 30-foot catfish. The other one looked at him and he said, really? That's nothing. The other day I hooked a lantern that had been on the bottom of the lake since the Civil War. I pulled it out and you know what? The light was still burning in it. After a few moments, the first fisherman said to the second one, I'll take 25 feet off my catfish if you take the fire off your lantern. <laughs> in life, folks, doors will open and doors will close. I can promise you that. Most of you already know that. But I've learned that when I make a commitment in my life that is Christ-centered, then God will always provide me with the skills that I need to accomplish His work and complete His task. In life, some of our greatest learning comes from our experiences. And we have a God who is already in the midst of our experiences as He calls each of us to make commitments to Him. So this morning, I challenge each of you to listen to God's call. And more importantly, listen in God's own time. God will call you. You may not be ready for that call today. God may not be ready to call you to that particular thing today. But it will come. And if you wait patiently and prepare yourself for his call, you will hear it when you listen, because God will call. So my question this morning is, 
Are you ready to respond when God calls? And how do you respond? Folks, you are part of a bigger catch. You are part of, of something we call fishing for the Lord. This morning, will you accept the challenge and make a commitment to God? You know, it isn't nearly as much of a sacrifice as you might think. I know. You sit there, because I've been there, and you say, oh, if I do this, boy, I've got to stop doing that. I, gotta, I might have to do this. I, I, I might have to stop doing this. You know, it's not as big a sacrifice as you might think. And I can promise you from personal experience what God can and will do when you answer His call will surprise you. When you answer His call to come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So I challenge you today. Say yes to God. The call will come. Some of you may be contemplating some kind of a call right now. Maybe you're fighting that call. I've, Lord knows I've fought a few of them in my life. I have. But you know, it's so much easier when you just say to God, yes, and God says, come and follow me. And I'll take care of all of the other things that come along with it. You just say yes to me. It's amazing what can happen. Lord, we know that we need to trust and believe in you. And so, this day, as we are gathered here in your holy presence, Lord, give us the strength to listen and then react and say, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I will go. I will do whatever it is you want me to do because I know that you will give me what I need to accomplish it. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, God loves each of us so much that sometimes God lets us go into a vein where we don't need to be. But God will always bring us back. He loves us that much. Somebody told me something one time that if you love something so much, sometimes you have to let it go. And God does. God lets us go, but God is always there when we're ready to come back. So I send you forth this morning telling you that no matter where you've been in your life, what you've done, where you've been, where you've gone, where you think you're going, where your life is now, it doesn't matter. What matters is that this moment on, you say yes to God and say, Lord, yes, I will follow you. So I send you forth as those whom God loves and cares for in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh,